In your patient with an SpO2 sat, we want to make sure that they're greater than 94% and don't have any signs or symptoms of hypoxia or respiratory distress. Prevent further injury to the injured part by carefully removing any jewelry or wet or restrictive clothing to prevent cause of further injury. If clothing is frozen to the skin, leave it in place. Secure the affected extremity to a board splint to minimize movement and elevate. No part of the injured extremity should be in direct contact with a hard surface. Cover the affected skin with dressing or dry clothing to prevent friction or pressure. And never rub or massage the affected skin. Never re-expose the injured skin to the cold. If the patient has a late or deep injury, carefully remove the jewelry. Cover the affected skin. Do not break any blisters or treat them with salve or any kind of ointment. Do not rub or massage, as before, and never apply direct heat to rewarm the affected part. And minimize movement, and at best, do not allow the patient to walk on any injured extremity. For rapid rewarming steps, immerse the affected part in a warm water bath just above body temperature, 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Keep the water temperature constant, stir the water to keep heat evenly distributed, and keep the tissue in the water until it is soft and color and sensation have returned. After thawing, dress with a dry, sterile dressing, place dressings between the fingers and toes, and elevate the extremity. Protect against refreezing, and then transport as soon as possible. Keep the patient warm and dry, and try not to re-expose them to the cold. Begin CPR if the patient is pulseless and apply an AED. As the patient continues to get rewarmed, consider re-defibrillation of the patient. Hyperthermia is caused by an increase in the body's heat production and the body's inability to expel that heat. Various types of hyperthermia you have heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. Heat cramps are caused by electrolyte imbalance to the muscle, most commonly from overexertion in hot temperatures with excessive diaphoresis or sweating. <clears throat> this usually is going to occur in the large flexor groups first, which is your quadriceps, okay, stomach, chest, all right. Heat exhaustion occurs when the body's cooling mechanisms have been expended and the central nervous system and other systems start to show the consequences of this depletion. Patients with extreme cases will present with dizziness or fatigue, normal body temperature, and diaphoresis. And a patient with heat exhaustion com commonly has slight alterations in mental status such as dizziness or fatigue, and can present with a normal body temperature and diaphoretic skin. Heat stroke, which is the most severe of the three, occurs when the body's heat regulatory mechanisms break down and become unable to cool the body sufficiently. The body becomes overheated, body temperatures rise, and sweating ceases in approximately half of your patients with this problem. Patients have severe altered mental status also. Some pre-existing illnesses that could make this worse would be heart disease, kidney disease, cerebral vascular disease, Parkinson's, thyroid gland disorders, skin diseases to include eczema, scleroderma, and healed previous burns, dehydration, obesity, infections or other conditions that can cause a fever, fatigue, diabetes, malnourishment, alcoholism, mental retardation, and peripheral vascular disease. All of these are pre-existing illnesses that can make these patients become hypothermic very quickly. Exercise and strenuous activity can cause the loss of more than one liter of sweat per hour and increase heat production. So exertional heat stroke is the second leading cause of death in high school students. Scan your scene for evidence that the patient is suffering from a heat-related emergency. Probably the most important factors to consider are the ambient temperature and the humidity. Infants and children left in closed vehicles or in structures that are hot and poorly ventilated are prone to heat emergencies, especially if the infant and child is overdressed and too young to remove their own clothing. 
elderly patients, especially those who are not mobile enough to escape their hot environments, are less are more likely to become victims of heat emergency. High temperatures, especially of greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit and relative humidity greater than 75 percent, combine to create an environment that renders the body's cooling mechanisms less effective. A patient with an altered mental status and hot skin is a high priority patient. So when you're doing your primary assessment, make sure that you address that. If the patient is in a hot environment, move them to a cool environment as quickly as possible. And if the patient is responsive, gather a history paying attention to the symptoms which may present themselves in their complaint. Get your OPQRST, okay, and it can be modified to gather further information about some of your symptoms. Gather a baseline set of vitals which can reveal a blood pressure that is normal or low. The heart rate and respirations are typically elevated in heat emergencies. Some of your general signs and symptoms, as you can see here if you're following along in your book, all right, you have a list of them. that signs and symptoms of a heat emergency. All right, they can range anywhere from a headache to seizures to muscle cramps to hot, dry, moist skin, loss of appetite, nausea, and vomiting. Make sure you move the patient to a cool place, such as the back of an air-conditioned ambulance, away from the source of the heat. If no cooler location is immediately available, at least try to move your patient out of the sun and into the shade. If breathing is adequate, administer oxygen with an armory breather or cannula, depending on your patient's presentation, to try to maintain a side of 94% or higher if no signs and symptoms of hypoxia, poor perfusion, or respiratory distress are present. Remove as much of the patient's clothing as you can. Loosen what you can't. The patient should be kept as comfortable as possible. You want to help cool the patient, but make sure they don't get chilled to prevent shivering, which increases heat production. Fanning the patient can help. We don't want to prevent the shivering because that's the body's natural mechanism to try to warm itself up. Consider raising the feet and legs 8 to 12 inches to improve blood circulation to the brain and other core organs. If the patient is fully responsive and not nauseated, have them drink some cool water. Consult with medical direction and follow your local protocols. If the patient is unresponsive, has an altered mental status, or is vomiting, do not give fluids or anything else by mouth. Generally, a hyperthermic patient or one that's too hot will have pale, moist skin that is normal to cool and temperature needs transport when the patient displays any of the listed criteria that you see here in this slide. So has an altered mental status, vomiting, refuses fluids, core temperature greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and does not respond to treatment. Now as far as a core temperature goes, that's not something we do in the field. We get either an oral, axillary, or we do have the capability of getting a surface temperature using our LifePak 15s. There's a sensor that we can use for that. However, we don't have the capability of getting a core temperature in a pre-hospital environment given the fact that our thermometers are oral. Remove the patient from the source of heat and place them in a cool environment. This is, called, this is a dire emergency. Cooling is the highest priority except airway breathing and circulation. If the breathing is adequate, make sure you give them signs and symptoms if they're producing a SAT over 94%. If there's no signs and symptoms of hypoxia, hypoxemia, poor perfusion, respiratory distress, or heart failure, okay, oxygen may not be necessary, but if their SATs are under 94%, you might want to consider the use of some sort of a supplemental oxygen device such as a cannula or a non-rebreather, depending on your patient's presentation. If breathing is inadequate, you may want to consider positive pressure ventilation all right, with some sort of an adjunct. Immediately begin to cool your patient. Generally, one method will not effectively cool the patient, so you may need to combine several different types of methods of cooling to speed the process up. Generally, one method is effectively not cooling, like you can see here. If you happen to have a spray bottle, misting your patient with some cool water and fanning along as you can see here. Also, you see ice packs along the carotid arteries and along the brachial arteries here. Some of the larger vessels, that's going to help circulate that cool temperature. Transport immediately, continuing to administer oxygen and cooling methods during transport. 
always transport a hypothermic patient with hot skin that is moist or dry, such as patients always need further emergency care. Consider early ALS intercept also. Consult medical direction before giving any patients a sip of any kind of a low concentration salt water at the rate of one half a glassful every 15 minutes. If possible, use a commercial product such as Gatorade with a low glucose content, so that would be Powerade Zero or some of the Gatorades that have half the amount of sugar. Salt water is made by diluting one teaspoon of salt in one quart of water and do not give the patient salt tablets. Do not do that. Try to gently stretch the involved muscle groups. Some experts advise massaging the involved muscles that are cramping if that doesn't cause additional pain. Reassess your patient every five minutes. Be prepared to establish an airway to provide positive pressure ventilation if breathing becomes inadequate. And also make sure that your pulse okay, is still there. It may be continued to be weakened or you can rate can increase further. So make sure you correlate changes in the pulse rate with the patient's mental status. Exercise associated hyponatremia, okay, which is low salt, also known as exertional hyponatremia and water intoxication, is associated with prolonged exercise or exertion. However, the pathophysiology of the condition is not from increased body core temperature, but from a depletion of sodium relative to water content in severe electrolyte imbalance. Mild causes of this are associated with nausea, vomiting, headache, bloating, and edema to the hands, legs, and feet. The hallmark findings to assess for this are a decrease in mental status, fatigue, headache, ill feeling, and nausea. Poisonous snake bites can include pit vipers or coral snakes. Just have to be the characteriz characterizations of the two puncture marks is usually what we're looking for. A poisonous snake bite is characterized by one or two distinct puncture wounds. The exception is the coral snake, which leaves a semicircular pattern with its teeth as it chews the skin. Many people who venture into the outdoors fear the possibility of snake bites, but in fact, such bites are relatively uncommon, and the number of people who die from snake bites each year is extremely small. The severity of a pit viper bite, depending on how much poison was injected, is gauged by how rapidly symptoms develop. Coral snake bites, for example, can, their effects can be delayed anywhere from one to eight hours. Okay. Our job is to gauge how quickly the area swells by marking the area and writing down the time. An emergency medical care for snake bites is the same as general emergency medical care for other bites or stings. Notice the location of the bite, presence of pathogens given the infectious material, pathogens and bacteria in the snake's mouth, the patient's weight and size patient's health, and amount of physical activity following the bite. Most bites and stings are usually not serious, but some people can have severe allergic reactions to them that can exacerbate this. So many people have common allergies to bees, wasps, hornets, or any other stinging insects. Most other people will have some sort of a large localized reaction with some minor swelling, itching, tenderization, which can usually be relieved by Benadryl or some other over-the-counter antihistamines. Black widow spider bites are leading cause of death from spider bites in the United States, and they are characterized by the hourglass marking on the spider's abdomen. They can be extremely fatal. But again, this is exacerbated by the health of the individual, how big or how small they are, and their age. When treating patients with a black widow spider bite, you should usually provide general wound care and transport. Commonly with these, you're going to get severe muscle spasms, rigid board-like abdomen, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, respiratory distress, and severe envenomations, and you're going to feel an initial pinprick, and then it becomes dull. As far as the brown recluse spider, okay, its victims are unaware that they have been bitten because the bite is often painless at first. Several hours after the bite, it becomes bluish, surrounded by a white periphery, and then a red halo or a bullseye pattern appears. 
Usually within 7 to 10 days, the bite becomes a large ulcer. And these spiders are usually characterized by a darker violin-shaped mark on the back. Okay, within 7 to 10 days, the bite becomes a very large ulcer, as discussed before. It kind of looks like this. As far as scorpions go, 90% of all scorpion stings occur on the hands, okay, or on the feet. Only one species in the United States produces bites that can be fatal, and the severity depends on the amount of venom injected. Signs and symptoms can include sharp pain, drooling, poor coordination, incontinence, and even seizures. Fire ant bites can cause large local reaction, given the amount of times that they bite you, and how many in the quantity that they bite you, characterized by swelling, pain, and redness that affect the entire extremity. Ticks, multiple different kinds out there, but there are some that can cause Lyme disease, usually transmitted by a tiny deer tick, but now thought sometimes to be multiple different kinds of tick that can cause Rocky Mountain spotted fever, other diseases All right, that ticks can also carry. We have to remove the ticks promptly by pulling them out with tweezers. You can also surround the tick with some sort of thick petroleum dressing that will basically starve the tick of oxygen and cause it to back out and then you can remove it safely. The only appropriate pre-hospital treatment for a tick bite is prompt removal of the tick which can help prevent infection. To remove it, use tweezers and grasp the tick as close as possible to the point where it is attached to the skin. The last thing you want to do is leave the head inside the scalp. Okay? Pull firmly and steadily until the tick is dislodged. Do not twist or jerk the tick because this can result in an incomplete removal, leaving part of the tick under the skin. Your priority during scene size it should be to protect yourself and your partner, of course. The last thing you want to do is get bitten or stung by whatever bit or stung the patient. Look for clues that may have caused the bite. Okay, look, see if there's swarm bees or hornets, or if it's a snake bite, see if the snake is still localized in the area. Okay, be prepared for anaphylactic shock, okay, because it generally has a rapid and life-threatening effect on the airway and breathing. So part of your primary assessment is going to assess your airway to make sure that this patient isn't starting to become having some sort of an anaphylactic reaction to what they were exposed to. Your secondary assessment. Okay, you are looking for signs and symptoms of anaphylactic shock that we need to treat immediately and looking for any kind of issues with the airway, localize reactions and treat similarly as an injected poison. Anaphylactic shock, which is a life-threatening emergency, can develop following bites or stings. If a patient develops signs and symptoms of this condition, perform the necessary emergency care and transport immediately. Some of the symptoms you may see are listed here. Hives, flushing, faintness, dizziness, so forth and so on. Upper airway obstructions, okay, airway narrowing. Additional signs, depending on the severity of the anaphylaxis, can be confusion, loss of responsiveness, convulsions, hypotension as well as cramps, difficulty breathing. If signs of hypoxia, hypoxemia, respiratory distress, poor perfusion all right, occur, and this patient is less than 94%, administer oxygen to achieve and get a SAT of 94% or higher. Depending on the severity of the anaphylactic shock, you may need to step in with supplemental oxygen via BVM with 10 to 12 per minute breathing at a rate of 15 liters per minute on the oxygen. Administer epinephrine with a prescribed auto-injector with permission from medical direction for patients with airway obstruction, wheezing, hypotension, or prior anaphylaxis. History of a bite from a spider or snake or a sting from an insect, scorpion, or marine animal. Okay? Pain that is most often immediate and severe or burning. Within several hours, the area can become severely numb. Weakness or fainting. Dizziness, fever, bite marks. Look for a stinger. Make sure you're using some sort of an object with a firm edge. We don't want to reach over and squeeze the thing. Squeeze the stinger to try to remove it because you're going to inject more poison under the skin. Use something with a flat edge such as a driver's license or a credit card to remove the stinger. Scrape the direction of the base of the stinger to avoid breaking it off below the skin. And be careful not to squeeze the stinger. We don't want to use 
tweezers, forceps, use our fingers, or anything of that sort. Some experts advise to use a constricting band all right, in the treatment of a snake bite, proximal to the bite. But before you do that, make sure that you consult medical direction and follow your local protocols, and then of course reassess your patient. Anaphylactic shock can take minutes to several hours to develop, so depending on when this patient was exposed, bitten, or stung, you may see this within the time that the patient is presented to you. So make sure that you're constantly on aware and on alert for signs and symptoms of anaphylactic reaction. The venom of marine life can cause more extensive tissue damage than that of land animals. The venoms of these aquatic creatures are destroyed by heat. So heat should be applied to marine bites and stings. Hot packs, warm saline, all right? In general, bites and stings inflicted by marine life should be treated the same as any other soft tissue injury. Okay, use forceps to remove the material that is stuck to the sting, but sting site, then irrigate with water, and don't attempt to remove any embedded spines that have been injected by the marine animal. If the patient were stung by a jellyfish, coral, hydra, or an enemy, carefully remove dried tentacles and pour vinegar on the affected area to denature the toxin. If meat tenderizer is available, sprinkle the area with it. Doing so helps stop the stinging also. Apply heat for roughly about 30 minutes throughout the transport if possible. <clears throat> lightning strikes. All right, we got to think, why might a lightning strike patient have retrograde or anterior amnesia? How does a lightning strike cause rupture of the tympanic membranes? Well, 100 million to 2 billion volts per bolt of electricity with a high amperage as high as 200,000 amps. Okay. Very quick, travels 1 to 2 million meters per second, and the contact surface temperature is anywhere from 15 to 60,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So that should explain your question right there, given the fact that the amperage on how high the amplitude of this is, interacting with their electricity, and the neurotransmissions of your brain can definitely lead to anterior or retrograde amnesia, as well as rupture of your tympanic membranes. A direct strike carries the highest rate of injury and death in the ground current. The farther the patient is from the strike, the less the injury and other affected suffers by the patient. The heart muscle has pr properties of automaticity, which means that it can stimulate its own impulse without the help of the brain. What commonly happens in a lightning strike patient is that the heart begins to beat spontaneously on its own without any intervention. However, the inspiratory centers in the medulla of the brain remain dormant for a much longer time. Despite the patient's heart resuming its beat and regaining a spontaneous pulse, the patient cannot yet begin to breathe on their own. <clears throat> you might see retro anterior grade amnesia as well as pale, cool, clammy skin. Temporary paralysis, dizzy, vertigo, seizures. Okay, for as far as the cardiac symptoms, they could go into a flat line or any kind of a lethal dysrhythmia, as well as respiratory distress or even apnea. Okay, you're going to see linear burns, a pair of streaks down the body caused by sweat heating up on the skin. Feathering is not a true burn. It appears as a non-blanching reddish-brown fern pattern. Punctuate, punctuate burns appear similar to cigarette burns. Thermal burns can occur if in clothing catches fire and then various other unusual burn patterns as well as the contraction of the muscles can cause bone fractures. All right? Lightning injuries are not typically major burn injuries. However, superficial linear patterns called Lichtenberg lines are very common. Unequal pupils, drooping eyelids, ruptured eardrums, tinnitus, or deafness. Make sure that the scene is safe. If clothing is on fire, put it out and definitely establish manual stabilization of the spine you possibly may see altered mental status as well. If the patient is in cardiac arrest, begin CPR, attach an AED, deliver defibrillation based on the analysis of the prompts of the AED, and provide aggressive ventilation with a high concentration of oxygen. General ill feeling, loss of appetite, headache, disturbance in sleep, respiratory distress upon exertion can be from altitude sickness. Okay, How can altitude sickness be prevented? Well, ascend slowly, okay? 
High altitude sickness can be prevented by ascending gradually, allowing the body time to acclimate to the body, limiting exertion on high altitude. 